Against the Current is sponsored in part by Surfpro of Pulaski and Laurel Counties. When fire or water damage takes over your life, trust the team in green at Surfpro to help you make it like it never even happened. They provide 24-7 service when you need it most. Give the local office a call at 606-877-2160 or online at surfpropulaskilaurelcounties.com. Franchises are independently owned and operated. So today I'm joined by Casey Pennington, owner of Mindsight Behavioral. You also have Mindsight Partners, consult with Casey, upcoming author, and a whole slew of other things uh, I'm sure, too, that I'm missing. Uh, Casey's from right here in Somerset with her husband, Trevor, and three kids, two girls, a boy, and a German Shepherd. Yes. Okay. Uh, my wife and I are expecting boy number three as well here in the next few weeks, so I'm about to get a little bit crazier. Yeah, yeah. It's really not that different, though, I don't think, with the third one. Just That's what people keep telling us. I'm really not sure if I'm ready to believe that or not yet, though, so we'll see, I well- guess. <laughs> Casey graduated from Lindsey Wilson College with a degree in mental health counseling. Uh, Monsite was founded in 2015 mm-hmm. and provides a variety of services, including individual, family, couples, group counseling, telehealth, case management, peer support, mental health assessments, community support, and much, much, much more. Um, we'll dive into a little bit more about Monsite and some of your other ventures as we get into it. With all that being said, I do like to start off with some rapid fire questions to kind of get the juices flowing a little bit and kind of usually I, I tend to catch people off guard with some of these questions. So that's, I, I think. I think we'll achieve that here too. First question was from Mr. Bradley Roberts, and this is a trick question because there are no wrong answers. What is your favorite taco? Yeah, I do not discriminate against tacos. So I can't tell you about, I did eat a cheesy bean and rice burrito for lunch. So I know if I had a taco, but. That's close enough. He he at least stirred that Mexican craving. Yeah. (laughs) Favorite superhero and why? Oh, someone else asked me this question on. I should I should know it. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's gonna it's gonna be a woman. Um, I don't know. I'm gonna have to come back to that one. You did stop me. Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> this next question um, was submitted via direct message, and I'm not gonna name any names here, but I think you might know who submitted it. Um, with your hands on your head, you may kind of already know, but on a scale of one to 10, how much do you like your feet rubbed? Every podcast I'm on, there's somebody asks this. Um, <laughs> probably a, a, like a 12. Like a 12. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming you know who submitted that question. That, that would definitely be Trevor since he submits this question every single time <laughs> on any podcast, no matter what it is. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, last two. Um, favorite book you read recently or podcast or both? Um, so I'm a little biased, but um, favorite book I've read recently would be, you know, I've read all of Mike Michalowicz's books, and for whatever reason, I never read The Pumpkin Plan, which was one of his earlier books, and I um, read it just a couple, maybe a month ago, and I loved it. So um, that's that's a good one that I've read recently, and of course, his podcast is hilarious, so I like it too. Kind of seasonal too. I mean, fall pumpkin plan goes goes hand in hand. Exactly. Yeah. Finally, last question here: Love to win or hate to lose? Mm, I really hate to lose. Yeah. I need to be keeping track of everybody's answers on that because it's it is actually pretty split down the middle, about fifty fifty. Really? So, I'm well, Casey, I, Casey, I gave about a thirty thousand foot view of what all you do, what all Mindsight does. Can you help take that a little bit more in depth for the listeners that, that may not know about you, may not know Mindsight, and just kind of a little bit about the who, what, when, where, why, how, uh, how everything got started? Sure. Yeah. So. Um, I've been a mental health clinician since 2009 and from 2009 up until 2015, I worked in a lot of different settings and a lot of different places. And what I was just, what I was seeing was that we had a lot of generalists in the area. Um, you know, it was like the, we take everybody kind of place and, and which is fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, but I just felt like for me personally, I was so pulled, you know, like if I saw a client coming in who was suffering from 
PTSD and I had to get in my head of how I was going to treat that. And then I had a different person coming in that had reactive attachment disorder and I had to figure out, you know, it was just a lot of mental back and forth trying to treat mm -hmm. these people. And what I realized was that I wasn't being as effective as I knew I could. So my goal was to start a behavioral health group that had specialties within it. So something where all of the providers there were just really good at, even if it was just one thing, they were just really good at that one thing. And I just decided that mine was going to be anxiety and panic disorders. Okay. And I can't tell you how many people tell me that was the stupidest decision I could ever <laughs> make. You know, you know, don't put yourself in a box. Like don't, don't corner yourself into the market. You're, you're going right. to lose all these clients. And I was like, yeah, but the ones that I'm going to get, I'm, I'm going to cure, like I can fix this. This is fixable. Right. And um, so I did it and it worked. I knew it would and it worked and people started getting better and started telling their friends and their family. And um, it just caught, it just caught on. And that was in 2015. And here we are in 2020 and we have uh, nine locations and um, about a hundred employees. Um, and, you know, from there, it kind of sparked the consulting side of what to do. But um, Mindsight is just one of those, one of those places that now there's a lot of. There's now, you know, that like niching down is, is become more popular now than it mm -hmm. was five years ago. Um, so now there's a lot more places like this that people can go to when they want one specific thing. So you know, I'm surprised. And I never really thought about that as far as with the, the counseling and, and niching down like that, because you see across the health industry, you have your specialist everywhere. You have, like we had on the earlier episodes, rheumatologists, you have heart surgeons, you have people that you have your, your general practice clinics too, that, that take care of everybody and anything that comes through. But this lack of better term, but what I hear a lot of is the riches are in the niches. Yeah. And so if you're able to focus on that part, then I think you can separate yourself. And like you said, you can provide a better level of care when you're focusing on one, two, three, four, a handful of things all the time. And you're not trying to care for everybody that walks through that door. Right. Yeah. I think, I think it's very natural for us as human beings to have that scarcity mentality right. of, Oh, if I, if I only do this then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to close myself off. And a perfect example of that is the, the girls up in Indiana I go up there to get hair done and they do one thing. That's it one thing in the shop. They don't just, they don't, they don't work with just anyone wanting a haircut. They do one specific thing and they are booming. And it's yeah. because they can do that one thing so well that it's so much better than everybody else. And that's just how they win. I think it's, I think it's a really good strategy. Well, I guess that brings me to a follow-up question a little bit more than what do you think, I guess maybe is a common misconception maybe not necessarily just about my side, but maybe as, as the counseling profession as a whole, or, or maybe, maybe even what's one thing people don't know or don't understand about the profession. Oh gosh, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> that, that could be its own show. Um, <laughs> I, I guess, I, I guess I would say if I had to pick one thing, a lot of times people in this profession, and that's part of the reason why I'm writing this book that I am, base for healthcare entrepreneurs is we are such clinical providers by nature. You know, we had that in instinct in us already, which caused us to want to go on and get a higher education, uh, whether you become a physician or a psychologist or a psychiatrist or whatever it is you decide to do, you, you want to help people. And I think that a lot of times um, people in the healthcare industry get, get, in this trap where they think, well, I have to compromise my morals in, or, in to order to run this business because I can't make money and help people at the same time. Yeah. And I see a lot of therapists trying to run their business like a therapist instead of trying to run their business like an owner. And right. that's where people start to have problems. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've worked in, I guess you'd say, which, Taylor Sears brought this up and I don't know if you've read um, the book by Gino Wickman traction. That was a big thing. He talked about that. They really implemented a big change in, in their business was taught, was trying to get the mindset of working on your business rather than just in your business. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's something that took a while for 
it wasn't that I didn't believe it, but it was that I felt so much guilt um, because of what my employees were going to think. If I wasn't in here busting my butt day after day, like sweating and you know, getting here at 5 a.m. and leaving at 8, you know, people just think right. that you have to just do this hustle and grind. And, and, and that's, that's a lie. You, you don't. And um, so it did take me a while to, be confident enough in who I am and what I do that I didn't have to then hold back because of what my employees were going to think. Or I didn't feel like I had to be down there in the trenches and on the front lines with them. Because the right. every time I would do that, I would take off that hat of working on my business and I get sucked back in it. And then I lose, I lose perspective. Right. So yeah, I think that that's, uh, that's a really good way to look at it. Well, and with that too, I, I know, obviously talk about the guilt of that you feel like if employees don't see you in there working every day, how, how do you come about as a business owner trying to decide, okay, yes, this over here, I need to delegate this in order to be able to be successful over here on this side of the actual business aspect too. So I delegate everything. I don't actually. <laughs> <Good> do <answer. laughs> um, one of the things that is so great in Mike McCallis's book clockwork is he is able to explain this in a way that has been better than anyone else I've ever heard. He explains it how, as the owner, your time should be spent designing. Um, you have people in your business that do and delegate, and that is not your job as an entrepreneur. Um, so that's what, that's, that's my superpower in my business. That's why it's my business is because no one is going to design it the way that I can. Right. And if I had to spend all of my time delegating things to people all day long, then what happens if I'm no longer there? Or if I decide to go on vacation and no one's telling them what to do, how right. are they going to think for themselves? So I don't, I said I delegate everything. That's that's kind of not true. I don't really delegate a lot because the way that we've structured Mindsight is to be a business that runs without me. And so I try to work really hard to teach my team this mindset and teach my team these strategies so that they very rarely ever ask me for anything. And if they do, I know it's because they just don't understand it yet. And it requires a little bit more teaching. Well, I'd say it has a lot to do then with the culture that you culture you try to implement there. How, I guess maybe how would you describe that? Maybe what's some stuff that has worked well, maybe hasn't worked well, something you want to try? Yeah. So culture is really hard. Um, it's one of those things that no matter how much time and effort you put into it, you get one wrong person and it's going to unravel everything you've ever done. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the hardest part is just being able to one hire the right people and then not be afraid to get rid of the people when you start noticing that they are negatively affecting the culture. I'd say that's been my biggest struggle is probably coming from that therapist mentality and somehow right. not practicing what I preach, um, trying to give people the benefit of the doubt when they're doing things that they really have no business doing and spreading rumors and gossip and just all the nastiness that, you know, goes on in businesses sometimes, not just nipping that in the bud immediately. And I've learned yeah. a lot over and over again with that. And I think I'm doing much better at that now. Something I like that uh, Dr. Lineski said when he was on a few episodes ago was, there are two office workplace rules. I don't know if these are posted or official or not, but one, no drama because especially in the health field it is applicable. It infects the workplace. And then number two, you're just not allowed to say that's not my job. Right. And just having that, that team first mentality. Yeah. I, I was talking to a business owner the other day and she was telling me this story about how one of her office um, staff, they were having a meeting in the, in the, she forgot that she ordered lunch for everyone and she forgot to order one person's lunch. And so she looked over and she said, Hey, so-and-so can you run over and get um, this lunch for this person? And that girl, she said was so offended by her wow. asking that question. And I thought, Oh my gosh, like 
my office manager, I don't even have to ask, but she'll just run down the street. If she knows I've been on calls all day long, she'll just go get me something to eat. I don't even ask her to, you know, we don't have that here. We don't, we don't have that. That's not my job or I'm too good for that. Or I don't, I don't clean or, um, you want me to vacuum what we don't, (laughs) we don't do that. We just don't, I think, and I think it's because no one has that attitude and so it doesn't it's not contagious if someone did have that attitude i could see how it could easily spread oh yeah no doubt talking a little bit about and then i want to switch gears a little bit to your consulting and the book you're working on um and this was a question we had come in was what kind of issues are are you seeing stem from the COVID shutdown so in regards to behavioral health, mental health, counseling, navigation, telehealth versus in-person, kind of a lot I know to unpack there, but as far as, and then he even mentioned too about non-reported abuse, suicide increase, and just all the the health factors that you all run into. What's, what's that been like during this last six, seven months? Yeah, every, everything is amplified. Everything is amplified. If, if you have a relation, if you have a relationship problem, if you and your spouse are having trouble, it's amplified now. Right. Um, if you've thought about suicide in the past, it's amplified now. There is no, everything has just, it's just gone up times 10. And we're seeing that. For example, we do a lot of dashboard tracking and KPI tracking and we watch every post we, we post regularly on social media through my website and we, uh, we categorize our posts with different topics and different subjects for um, different calls to action. And one of the things that we've noticed is any time that we post about suicide or unemployment rates, the engagement on those two subjects just skyrocket. I mean, they're wow, going That's through. really interesting. Yeah. And it's because it's on people's minds. They see it and they're clicking on it because they can relate to it. And it's, it's really sad, but I will say the good thing or the good news is we, we have people reaching out for help. You know, we, we are in a counselor shortage right now. Um, We are hiring in every single location. We are offering sign on bonuses. We are offering to pay for people's, um, specialties and certifications because we want to help people around here and it's just I'm glad that people are reaching out but it's hard because we're running out of counselors yeah I guess kind of how sorry I'm trying to think about which way I want to go with this now when you talked about key performance indicators with your KPIs is that talking about do you all have that set up, I guess, maybe for your social media strategy as well, or is that more so just looking at your employees and what kind of what's going on there? We track KPIs for absolutely everything. Everything. So one of the things that I always tell people is if you're going to spend money on it, you better track it. Right. Um, so anything we are spending money on that we are have any kind of client acquisition costs or employee acquisition costs or any kind of costs associated, we mm-hmm. are tracking. When did you shift to that mindset within your business as far as really trying to track it? Day one? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. What has been one of the biggest things you've learned in that process? Um, so you can't shy away from those numbers. You can't, a lot of times people put that off because it, they're intimidated by it. They're not confident in it, but it's just like, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm like this. If I, if something's not feeling right in my body and I think, okay, something's going on. I don't know what it is, but I know something's not right. I know I need to go to the doctor, but I don't really want to go because I don't really want to hear what they're going to tell me. You know, right. you start battling with yourself. And, uh, I think that's what people do in business too. I don't think it's any different. I think that they know something's not right, but they're kind of afraid to get in there and start digging around because they're afraid of what they might find. And then also more than that is when they find it, they don't know what to do with it. So I think that, um, it's important to just, just face those fears as a, as an entrepreneur. And just, if you don't, feel confident and with your numbers and you don't understand them, reach out, get some help because they're really not as scary as we think they are. I think it's that fear of the unknown and you're also fearful that you may see something that you know in your gut, like you talked about, it's probably right, but you don't want to see that because you don't want to have to address it. You don't want to have to fix it. So that, that makes a lot of sense there. I think it's a good point too for us or a good time now for us to kind of switch gears and talk about um, consult with Casey about their book you're writing hit on those two a little bit for me. 
So I started my consulting business about two and a half years ago okay. and started out very, very part time, you know, just a few hours a month, um, not anything sure. crazy. And now, you know, I probably spend more time on the consulting side of things that I do on my side. And that's just because we've worked through systems and processes in my side. So where it doesn't actually need me to run. Right. Um, so within consulting, that's that's kind of what I do is I help people create businesses that run without them. Um, I think that's why a lot of us want to be in business is for freedom. A lot of us who are business sure. owners like to play by our own rules. We don't want to clock in and clock out every day and have to ask when we can go pee. Um, we just want to do our own thing. And that was definitely me. So it kind of seems counterintuitive to have that reason for starting and then start something that 100% relies on you for everything. Right. Um, so within consulting, that's, that's really what I do is I help other businesses create those systems and processes so that they can be there if they want to be. And if they don't, they don't. Have you noticed and something I've, I see and hear discussed about a lot within my own industry, have you noticed that working with these other counseling professions and other counseling businesses, that the systems and processes you have in place in Mindsight don't work at the next one and don't work at the next business and the next business, that it's not necessarily a cookie cutter approach that everyone has uniqueness within it, or, or is it all pretty much the same? Hey, if you'll just do A, B, C, D, and E, you're going to hit, you're gonna hit results of, is it, it okay. pretty much all works. Now, that doesn't mean that I could take exactly what I'm doing here and apply right. it to another practice that has a different model and it all work. No. Right. Um, but, you know, most businesses in, in the healthcare space have five core systems and, you know, we're all looking at the same thing. We have we have sales. We got to get new people in. We got to have profit. We got to have order. You know, those are the three things that we all need. And so when you think about it like that, you, t you have your foundational system and then you just make slight modifications to make it work. Thankfully, okay. because if not, it might probably be a lot harder if I had to <laughs> come up with something brand new every single time. Well, have you branched out into any other industries or are you stick, have you stuck straight with counseling profession? Yeah, so I've, I've, I have worked with other industries, mostly okay. in healthcare. There are a few that we've played around with some with uh, real estate, photography, just to test it and see sure. how different it is. Um, but I will say that after this book that I'm working on launches next fall, um, we are opening that space up. We have another brand that's getting ready to launch that is more... Um, it's just more geared toward business owners of all types and uh, okay. in all industries. Well, it's, since you hinted at it a little bit there, let's go ahead and talk about that book you're working on. Yeah. What do you want to know? Let's know what it's about, the, the problems you're trying to address with it. We know fall of next year. Yeah. Um, okay. So this book is a derivative off of Mike McCallowitz's book, Fix This Next. Okay. Um, <clears throat> This book is written specifically for healthcare entrepreneurs who are looking for a sense of direction in their business. So what the, the book has a few core messages, but basically it's this most business owners, and this is for every business. Uh, most business owners don't know what their biggest problem is. I mean, their biggest problem is that they don't know what their biggest problem is. And <laughs> so what we find ourselves doing is just giving all we've got all the time and we're burnout and we feel like we're stuck on this hamster wheel and we should be a lot further than where we are. We should be making a lot more money than, than what we are. Um, but what we're doing is we're just working that to-do list, you know, like we're making decisions based off of what feels most important, what feels right, um, what my gut's telling me, you know, maybe I, maybe I should grow. This is the time to scale. Maybe I should buy this building. Yeah, I have a feeling I should do this. But see, that's where we all go wrong because you can't run your business based on gut instincts because your business is not wired within you. You know, like I could say to you, hey, I just have this gut feeling that something's wrong with my, I don't know, that I may have arthritis. We're talking about arthritis. <laughs> 
um, you know, so because I've got these problems and like things are hurting and I just have this gut feeling that something's wrong. Well, you need to listen to that because it's your gut. It's in your body. You're talking about yourself, but your business is not in you. And so all these people out here are just like working and working and working and they're just they're they're doing the wrong thing at the wrong time and it's not moving their business forward. So what the book is trying to do is help provide people, business owners, a compass that will give you a full proof strategy so that you know what to do and when to do it at all times so that you're not wasting time and so that you're not just working just to work. You're working with a purpose and you're working towards something um, like that's that. going to move your business forward. What's that process been like writing that book? Oh, <laughs> uh, different than what I ever imagined writing a book would be. Um, so I got, I was very fortunate and was able to get into a book work, writing workshop with one of the best ghost writers. She's ghost written so many New York times bestsellers. It's not even oh, wow. funny. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I've been in this workshop and she's really put me through the ringer and challenged me in a lot of ways. And I always knew I wanted to write, but I never had anything to write about because <laughs> yeah. I had never done anything. Um, but just being an entrepreneur and having these businesses and all these experiences has just given me something now that I have a very clear vision on what I want to write about, how I want to help people. And it's been a, it's it's just been a, I don't know the right word. It's, um, it's just been a very emotional and personal process of, of writing. And it's really scary too. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't imagine. It's probably very similar to launching this podcast. I'm sure you have that, that inner troll. That's like, what if people think I'm stupid or, you know, well, what if I say something dumb? Yeah. And I, I think you hit on exactly. I thought I had with, with starting this is what am I going to talk about? I think yeah. once you get over that hurdle and that doubt that you tell yourself, then I think your vision can become more clear and then you can focus on, okay, here's what I want to focus on. And sometimes you just got to put blinders on and just do it. And then other times it'll, you have a little bit more of a plan, but either, either way, I think it'll work out there. Yeah. I don't know if you read blogs, but I, I wrote one just a couple nights ago that said, um, everything you've been told is a lie and mm -hmm. it's about confidence. And it is so, after I read it, like, I, or after I wrote it, I've gone back and read it several times. And I just keep thinking, yeah, I, was, I still believe what I said, because um, we think that we have to find this confidence within us before we can go and do something. And I think that that's a lot. You got to get permission first. Yeah, I think, think you do. Yeah. I think you just got to do it. And then you find your confidence after you. Yeah. And think about all of the, the time and the opportunities we're missing out on because we're we're waiting until we feel confident to do something. Yeah. What if we just yeah. did it and then expected confidence to come? Well, and I think, again, talking about launching the podcast, one of the most surprising things I've had in, in this journey so far, just in a few short weeks, is how many people have come up to me and have said, I've always wanted to do that or I've always wanted to start one. And I'm sure them, just like I did forever, was <clears throat> wrestling with myself, waiting for someone to tell me, hey, it's OK. You, you can go do this now and you don't need to. Yep, exactly. I want to talk, I guess, maybe a little bit more about the book, a little bit about your, your business processes, processes and stuff. Um, when you're looking to scale your business. So when you went from one location, Somerset only, I mean, I remember coming to your ribbon cutting when you all started as probably 2015, 2016 that little bitty office that had maybe three or four rooms and now you're up to nine locations. Yeah. When you're looking to scale your business, what do you need? What needs to happen first? What do you need to address first? That's a good question. Um, so I don't, I'm going to start talking with my hands. I'm sure people watch. Hi, you're fine. Okay, but, um, so Maslow's hierarchy of needs. A lot of people know what that is. I've heard about it. You know, that it's a triangle. Um, the foundational level is um, safety. Um, you know, we have to be safe. We have to feel safe. And and then the higher the once we have one level short up, then we can work on the next. And then you have self actualization at the top. So a business is very similar to that. But the foundational level of a business is sales. And 
when I say sales, I don't necessarily mean like sales, you know, this, sure. these are, these, this is comprised of five different components. Um, lifestyle congruence, client conversion, collecting on commitments, delivering on commitments, um, prospect and provider attraction. So um, one, before you scale, you have to have met all of those core needs within that foundation of your business, which is sales. And then above sales, you have profit. I mean, that's the goal of business, right, is to be profitable. Right. So if you're not profitable now, scaling is not going to make you profitable. You've got to fix right. the things and the profit level that is keeping you from being profitable. So I think, um, and then above profit, you have order. So this is where you have your systems and your processes. All of those three things together combine something of a very solid infrastructure. So I think when it comes to scaling, you have to have those three foundational levels of your business secure before you start duplicating and scaling, because otherwise you're going to be spending, you're going to be putting more pressure on your systems. You're going to be more putting more pressure on your, on your cash flow, um, more pressure on your profit. And you're going to have this, this, um, this fear of not getting sales, because if you don't get sales, you're, it's not going to work, you know? So I think that I think that creating that um, infrastructure is the most important thing before you start looking to scale. It's like the house that was built on sand with the sand foundation. Yeah. You try and grow that and put more pressure and more pressure and more pressure. It's going to collapse versus building that strong foundation first. That's mm -hmm. going to allow you to, to put more pressure in and scale it like that. Um, we talked a lot about, and you keep going back to trusting your gut and that's okay for health problems, but maybe not necessarily for the business problems. Mm -hmm. How do you know when your business is on the right track? Um, well, so one of the things that you'll find in the book is, is called the healthcare hierarchy of needs. And if you're looking at the Mike's book, fix the sex, it's called the business hierarchy of needs, the BHN. Um, it is an assessment basically for your business. And there's 25 questions on it on mine, on the healthcare hierarchy of needs there's only 15 um but so there's 25 questions on there and if you can answer yes uh to the majority of those questions on that assessment then your business is doing well but ultimately i believe the indicator of if your business is doing well is your profitability your margins you know because you can, you can't base it on how many how many new patients you have or how many new programs you've sold um because that really could mean absolutely nothing you know like if if you said hey i grossed a hundred thousand dollars this year and i had a 50 percent profit margin and i told you hey i grossed a million dollars this year and had a one percent profit margin yeah. you know it doesn't it doesn't matter how much your gross is you got to look at your your profitability because that's that's what you have to um, compare yourself to. So I would say looking at profitability would be. And I think that goes back to what you talked about with, with tracking your numbers or not just tracking, tracking everything and knowing your numbers and getting past that fear of looking at everything, because then you can know exactly what's going on and you can fix, you can hopefully stop that 1% profit margin on a million dollars in sales from happening before you get to that point. Um, when you were coming up with those 15 questions, what was that process like of wrestling with it? Of Okay. Hey, this is, I'm going to stop here at these 15 questions. These are the 15 that need to be answered and, and not having less, not having more. You mentioned Mike having 25. Well, fortunately Mike did the majority of the work there. So I just took something that already worked. Um, his includes two additional levels in the pyramid, which is impact gotcha. and legacy. And mine does not. And I purposely left those off because I think most of the people who are going to read this book are not there yet. We're not, we're not focusing on the kind of impact we're making and the kind of legacy we're leaving because we're just trying to figure out how to get more, more leads. <laughs> or yeah, cross that bridge to, when you get there. Yeah, yeah. So I left all that out. Um, and so I took, I took his initial question or assessment and just modified it, but I swear to you, it is genius. And I was teaching this, I'm doing this thing called groom your coup track. Um, and it's quite funny. It's for people who are looking to start grooming someone that they would like to take over the operations of the business. Sure. And so as I was explaining this to Brittany yesterday and trying to teach this concept to her, one of the things that she said was just, I was like, 
thank God. <laughs> she said, oh my gosh, this makes me feel so much better. She said, because <laughs> I'm working every single day and I know I'm busy, but I don't always know that I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. And this will never fail me. She said, I can ask myself these questions every single week and I'll always know what specific thing I should be focusing on. And I was like, yes, that's exactly how it's supposed to work. Well, that's another thing I was going to say too, is a lot of times, and I think for people maybe not even necessarily in maybe ownership or a manager or whatever, whatever their position may be, they are basically in a rut. They, they are working all the time. They're busy all the time, but it doesn't mean that they're working on the right things. So yeah. how, I guess, and I'm sure this assessment is going to help get them to that point, but how does it, how can a business owner know or that they're taking the right steps or how is it possible for a business owner that says, Oh, there's no way this can't happen in my business. I've got to be there running it every day and doing everything. How do, how do you separate that? No. And you need to get it in check. If you, you think, broke, sorry, you, you broke out a second there. I want to make sure we get that. Yeah. So that would be called your ego. And you need to check <laughs> that at the door. If there you think that you are so important that your business is going to die without you, then You've got some problems. Um, that is your first indication that you have a problem. <laughs> um, now, I say that jokingly, kind of, but not really. If you are a business owner and you want your business to be all about you, then more power to you. That It's your business. You design it however you want to. Um, but I think, uh, gosh, man, there's so many, there's so many different ways you could look at that. Um, but I think that... One, just really getting clear on what you want your business to be and reverse engineering that process. Um, but if, you know, if people are thinking this could never happen to me or how do I know that what I'm doing is the right thing? One of the things that works, it's, it's kind of like a little experiment that you can do for yourself is ask yourself first, how many hours a day are you working? And this is total, like this is sitting at home, eating dinner, checking your email, like all the time in the day that you, you catch yourself working. And then ask yourself, what if I only had two hours a day that I was allowed to work? What would I do in those two hours? And like, write it down. Some people because are getting anxiety I, listening to this right now. <laughs> yeah, but man, it's powerful. Like it is powerful. And you ask your employees to do the same thing and your mind will be blown at what they write down. Um, but when you restrict your time, you automatically start prioritizing. And that is a game changer in your business because what, what happens is we go around all the time saying, well, I don't have time to do this, or I don't have time to meet with you, or I don't have time to go to your Mary Kay party, or I don't have time to do this. But that is not true. I believe that we have time to do every single thing that we need to do. And it's just that the things that we are prioritizing don't always match up with those needs. So restrict your time and see how your priorities change. That's really good. Yeah, I made that up. It may not be a thing. Somebody may have like coined that somewhere, but <laughs> we'll, we'll give you credit for it. It's fun. Thanks. Well, Casey, I want to be a good steward of your time. So I don't, I don't want to keep you too much longer. Some of the biggest things I, I, I can take away from this is obviously you guys have a great practice, very well run practice. You guys do tremendous amount for the community. Um, you're always there willing to help and trying to, to help um, those people that are in need that, that are um, needing your services from a business standpoint, some stuff I've taken away is tracking everything, the KPIs you have in place, running, and again, kind of reiterates from another episode we had recently was working on your business and not in your business and being willing to get out of your own way and having the confidence to do that and push through with that. Um, what else would you like our listeners to know? Um, I would just say, you know, if you don't, if you, if you don't have, or don't think you have confidence to do whatever it is you want to do in your business, or if you're not a business owner in your community or in your life, don't wait until you have it to do it, just do it and it will come. And I think that if we had more people that were living with that kind of philosophy, we would have a whole lot more going on in Somerset, Kentucky. And that would be, I agree with you. Yep. 
if you don't, if you don't mind, will you send me over that blog post you wrote? I want to link that in the show notes so people can, can get that too. Um, as far as for people, if they want to get in contact with you about, Hey, I've got this question about my business or about a process. What's the best way for somebody to do that? Yeah, I would follow us on social media. We're very active. We have a whole team that run our social media account and um, I would send it through my, my Casey Compton um, social media rather than mine site because that's a different team. Um, but we, we will always answer any questions. And if people see a post and think, oh, man, this makes me wonder, ask the question right there on the post. That's what it's there for. So we will answer everything that we see. Okay. And you mentioned, too, you all are hiring in every city and every market. Yes. If someone wants to, to come work with you, wants to apply, where do they need to go? You just need to go to our website, mindsetbehavioral.com. Like I said, we have $1,500 sign on bonuses right now, and we are paying for certifications. We are offering full time salaried positions with amazing benefits. Like, we are literally just hanging it all out there and saying, <laughs> We need you. We need good people. So, okay. yeah, just go to our website. Okay. I'll be sure to link that in the show notes too so we can get everybody, get you all a few more employees, and we'll get people taken care of. Well, Casey, I appreciate you taking the time to, to have this, to talk with me about business processes and talk about your new book and wish you the best of luck in getting that finished and getting it ready to launch a year from now. Hopefully, fingers crossed, COVID will be done with and out of here by that point. And we won't even, we'll just look back and laugh at that point. But, right. <laughs> but thank you and, and best of luck with your business, with your book and everything. I really appreciate it. Thank you.